checkered tile floors, a uniform row of leather cushioned booths, the smell of burgers and fries wafting out from the small kitchen nestled behind the metallic serving counter, a recognizable low hum, the whirl of the milkshake. The lit up neon sign in the front window spells open. A large wooden jukebox sits against the rear wall. It's quiet now at this late afternoon lunch hour, but come nighttime, the sturdy coin operated machine will surely be belting out jazz classics or rock and roll. You sit down and after a brief but not immediate moment, a waitress wearing a red dress and a white waist apron comes over to take your order. There are only a few items on the plastic laminate menu, but you don't really need it to order. You could probably guess all of them anyway. This place feels one of a kind, and at the same time, it could be anywhere. You could be in Atlanta or Albuquerque. Unless you step outside or pay super close attention to the accents of the staff, or the subtle geographic clues given by the sports, music, or automobile memorabilia lining the walls, you'd hardly know. There is nowhere so universally American as this place. The diner. An institution. It has appeared in movies, TV shows, comic books, novels. Politicians routinely make their way through while on the campaign trail in hopes of being photographed seeking a surefire boost to their ordinary Joe appeal. In fact, every president in the past 50 years has probably been pictured in one. Although you might rightly see this style of restaurant as iconic, synonymous with American life, it hasn't always been this way. Getting here was no easy road. Yet despite having fallen on hardship at several points along the way, Loving support from dedicated patrons across the country has always been enough to help the diner stage a comeback. Even today, it's still going strong. But how did the diner get its start? What is the story behind this unique, distinctive place? It may not be exactly what you expect. This is the tale of how the American diner grew into what it is today. Providence, Rhode Island, 1872. This is Walter Scott. Since an early age, he has been an enterprising man. As a teenager, he would wander the unforgiving New England streets, selling candy, fruit, and newspapers to passers-by in order to support his widowed mother and bolster the family's meager income. Scott parlayed his success at this venture into a gig selling late-night snacks and coffee to the clientele of local men's clubs. After being rejected from serving in the Union Army during the Civil War, owing to his poor eyesight, he took up farming for a few years. However, the monotony of fieldwork didn't suit his entrepreneurial spirit, and before long he returned here, to the streets of Providence. Now, he's trying out a daring new business venture. The Night Lunch Wagon, he calls it. Not exactly a flashy name, but a descriptive one. He brings it out as the sun begins to set, his homemade, horse-drawn wooden cart, its exterior painted with eye-catching advertisements for sandwiches, coffee, and other delectables on offer. Pedaling this vehicle over the rough cobblestone pavement, Scott fills a glaring gap in the market. Restaurants are all closed by this time, but hungry night shift workers continue to ramble through the busy streets till the wee hours. Scott finds in them an enthusiastic and appreciative customer base. The idea catches on. By 1887, it has spread to nearby Worcester, Massachusetts where a man named Thomas Buckley sees potential in the business and goes about producing the wagons at commercial scale. His White House Cafe wagons become a recognizable brand in the area. 
Samuel Jones, also in 1887, takes things to the next level by installing wooden seats for dining within the wagons themselves. Copycats continue to emerge as momentum grows. The concept, though, is the same. Fresh-cooked, affordable food staple, out of the back of a truck. Charles Palmer, another Worcester resident, is the first to patent the invention in 1893. Before long, you can find them in cities across the country. People start referring to the wagons as lunch cars, which then becomes dining cars and eventually is shortened to diners. With the proliferation of these rolling restaurants come concerns about congestion on busy city streets. In response, some diner owners around the early 1910s start experimenting with stationary diners, which would stay in one place but provide the same cozy, accessible street food appeal. A salesman through and through, Walter Scott brought the diner to the masses. By the time he eventually passes in 1924, his brainchild is on the cusp of national stardom. The Roaring Twenties are when the diner really takes on the signature look it carries to this day. One of the stationary diner pioneers, a New Jersey man named Jerry O'Mahony, realizes a bottleneck in the business model. Though diners are immensely popular, building one remains a painstakingly manual process. To address this, O'Mahony founds the Jerry O'Mahony Diner Company in 1917. The goal of which? To mass produce diners for use across America. The diners are prefabricated in the company's factory and shipped via truck to their eventual locations, at first in cities up and down the eastern seaboard. But O'Mahony diners look a lot different than anything that has come before. Built in the so-called rail car style, they are long, narrow, and metallic buildings. They symbolize speed and mobility, resembling new forms of transportation and hearkening to the exciting precipice of the machine age. Early models have barrel roofs and skylight vents, though these features eventually fall out of fashion in the 1930s and 1940s. Not only does the company streamline the production process in order to limit costs, it also hatches an ingenious marketing blitz in order to convince potential proprietors to start their own diners. Its ads sell the alluring idea of autonomy and economic success. Present-day business conditions are more favorable for dining car owners than ever before. Be your own boss, one ad reads. Desirable locations are plentiful. Hundreds of miles of new highways and innumerable towns throughout the country await the establishment of these modern eating places. Study the dining car field. Assure your independence. Earn a larger income than most salaried men ever receive. Place yourself among the more prosperous members of your community. This offer, to many, proves hard to refuse. By the 1950s, nearly 6,000 O'Mahony diners operate from their humble proving grounds of North Jersey all the way to California. O'Mahony's innovation helps usher in New Jersey's golden age of diner manufacturing and cements the Garden State's standing as the, perhaps self-proclaimed, diner capital of the world. Though numbers of the original models have dwindled, 2,000 O'Mahony diners remain even today. Over 600 of those are in New Jersey. If you imagine that classic diner look, you're probably picturing an O'Mahony diner. Despite a blip during the Great Depression due to the hard economic times, Diners rebounded astoundingly after World War II. And why wouldn't they? Diners provided Americans with convenient, comforting meals at a reasonable price. Bacon and eggs, liver and onions, meatloaf and mashed potatoes, 
generous portion sizes too. Whether it's aspiring mob boss Rico Bandello in the 1930 movie Little Caesar, or the hard-working mother and businesswoman Mildred Pierce in her eponymous 1945 film, anyone and everyone can eat in one. Many returning American veterans, eligible for GI loans, decide to get into the diner business and are hugely successful. And these fine establishments no longer exist just in cities. The suburbanization of America is well underway, and diners join the American population in this migration. Pretty soon, every small town in the country has its own, and they are now family-oriented. Diner architecture, too, changes with the times. The 50s bring terrazzo floors, formica countertops, stainless steel panels, porcelain enamels, and neon signs. Newfound fascination with interstellar exploration inspires shiny space-age designs, and large, visible, street-facing windows become popular, especially in less urban places, where businesses have to attract passing motorists. Diners increasingly become more than for just eating, even taking on the role of community civic centers, after-school hangout haunts, and even a trendy date spot. People use them as meeting places, coming together to discuss local issues and partake in a rich public discourse. With most, if not all, operating 24 hours a day, the diner is always there when you need it and it will be for you whatever you need it to be. And a lot of the time, that's just a good old fashioned burger and fries. This is the first true heyday of the diner. Like all great times, this period of diner dominance doesn't last forever. By the late 1960s and early 1970s, a new challenger enters the arena the fast food restaurant. Unlike the diner, this new type of restaurant offers uniformity, rapid service, and brand reputation. Increased pre-processing of ingredients in fast food reduces the need for kitchen employees, which are increasingly hard to come by and that diners continue to rely on. McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, these names begin to occupy the cultural consciousness. The diner struggles to keep up. Many shut down. During the tough economic times of the late 1970s, though, Americans look back to the diner in hopes of recapturing the magic of their shared past. Because of this, diners take on a nostalgic quality, and even new ones are built in the famous 1950s style a look which persists even today, as if the diner has found itself visually frozen in time. Newfound interest not only helps support the remaining diners, which have avoided closure, but also galvanizes new ideas. The popular sitcom Alice, which starts airing in 1976, takes place in a diner. More avant-garde diner concepts emerge like the Empire Diner in Manhattan, which also opens in 1976. With its noticeable Empire State Building replica adorned rooftop and high-end menu offerings, celebrities are known to frequent the place. Good old-fashioned diners, too, enjoy resurgent popularity. No longer are they the exclusive territory of working-age white men either, as they were in the early days. Now, a large number of them are operated by women and immigrants, people from Greece, Thailand, and Costa Rica, to name a few. Even new chain restaurants like Denny's and Waffle House adopt the diner aesthetic, starting a new trend of what becomes known as the diner restaurant. These more recognizable chains allow the restaurant format to enter foreign markets like Europe and Asia, which are less familiar with the traditional American diner. The diner is now global, and it's here to stay. 
That leaves us to today. Diners have experienced ups and downs over the years, but they continue on unflinchingly, a popular and familiar place to grab a quick meal, no matter who you are. Many enthusiasts are now taking active steps to recognize their historical significance in American life. Several diners, including Mickey's Diner in St. Paul, Minnesota, Triangle Diner in Winchester, Virginia, the Miss Albany Diner in Albany, New York, and several dozen others have been added to the National Register of Historic Places, a distinction that declares these sites worthy of preservation due to their cultural importance. Even some of the old prefab diners which have fallen into disrepair have been purchased, refurbished, and relocated by restaurateurs, hoping to bring their retro charm to a new audience. The Food Network's 2015 TV show, American Diner Revival, centers around this concept. A lot of the time, relocation means hitching the structure to a truck and hauling it over roads and highways to its new home, exactly as the original owners did nearly 100 years ago. Most probably haven't moved in the time since. But lest you should despair that these diners have rusted into their roots, become immobile and weighed down like some ancient relic, the engine revs and with a strenuous creak, the heavy metal frame lifts up from its bearings, back on the road again. This is the diner after all. Built to be tough, durable, and resilient to change, it's meant to move forward. That, more than anything, is why it has earned such a special place in the hearts of people across this wide and diverse country. So, next time you're feeling hungry, why not go grab a meal at your local diner? You're sure to come away feeling full, both in stomach and in spirit.